up your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. You know, I, I came up probably with, I don't know how many different titles for this, but I wanted to name this to encourage you, Characteristics of a Successful Believer. Characteristics of a Successful Believer. Psalm chapter 1. Let's all stand up, please, with the reading of God's Word. I was only going to read verses 1 through 3, but because it's so short, we've memorized the psalm, I'm going to uh, go right through to verse 6. The Bible says in verse number 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now notice he, Solomon changes here. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly, he says, shall perish. Characteristics of successful believers. Psalm chapter 1. You folks will watch by television. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. And Lord, as we work our way through this, we pray that the Spirit of the living God would open up the eyes of our understanding, open up our hearts, Father. Lord, I pray that you, uh, uh, pray that you would plow up the furrows of our heart, that the seed of the Word of God would fall into fertile soil, and we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our blessed Savior, whom we love and whom we worship, and hopefully who's coming again soon. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Beloved, there is no definite evidence as to who the author of this psalm is. Now, a lot of people think that, well, King David wrote Psalm 1 right through to uh, uh, chapter 78, but that's just not true. But there's strong gr grounds for suspecting that his son, King Solomon, wrote this. Now, even the casual reader will note a strong similarity between the book of Proverbs and also this first psalm. Now, he's saying King Solomon. What's he doing? He's speaking to his son Rehoboam, and he's trying to teach him two important lessons in life that both he and we need to learn. He does this by contrasting two things. Number one, in verses one through three, he shows us the way of saints before God. Let me say that again. In verses 1 through 3, he shows us the way of saints before God. That is how they can become richly blessed by God, how they can become morally and spiritually and physically prosperous, successful by God, if they constantly and continuously follow his word, will, and ways. Secondly, beloved, he does another thing by showing that number two, the warning to sinners by God, and that's found in verses 4 through 6. The ungodly are not so, but like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And then Solomon goes on and he shows us what happens to them. In other words, their utter destruction of those who ignore what God has to say in his word, and instead they choose to follow evil. Now, beloved, a lot of times we talk about evil in the scripture. We're thinking about the murderer. We're thinking about the thief. It's not. Whenever you're living in disobedience to God's word, God says you're evil and wicked in my sight. That's what the Bible defines it. It's not what Pastor Joel does. You know that if you read the word of God. Now, beloved, as we study Psalm 1, it is known as the gateway psalm. In other ways, it's the worthy doorkeeper to the book of Psalms. Why do they call it that? Because as you read this psalm, it sets the tone for all the rest of the psalms. It speaks about how God's going to deal with those who he calls godly, and also how God is going to deal with those whom he calls ungodly. Now, beloved, I emphasize the word and the pronoun he, not me, but what God says is godly and what God says is ungodly. Amen? I mean, the book of Psalms is filled with it, beloved. And that's why, as you read the book of Psalms, it almost sounds like Solomon wrote the whole thing because there's, there's so many different parallel, Hebrew parallels, synthetic parallelisms, parallelism, and uh, synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism, B-line, B-line, and stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is, God is showing us constantly the contrast between these two groups of people, and he wants us to understand that. So, beloved, here we find insight 
to what makes a believer successful and why he receives the blessedness for living a holy and righteous and godly life. And it also teaches us the temporal and eternal danger of just living for, our, for sin or for self or for this evil world system. Remember, beloved, Satan is not the God who controls all of this world. He's the God, the Bible says, of this present evil world system. You find that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Okay? He's the God of this evil world system. The glit and glitter is everything to attract your mind, attract your soul, to get you away from wanting to submit and surrender and follow the Lord. That's the battle, isn't it? It's always been the battle if you studied the Word of God. Now, there are many yardsticks by which men measure success. For example, some measure success by riches and wealth. They say, I must be very successful uh, because I've got all kinds of money. Some measure success by power and position. Some measure success by reputation and prestige. And beloved, these are indeed all indicators of some type of worldly success, good, bad, or indifferent. In other words, when I grew up, I grew up with people I knew that were in the mafia, okay, and they were rich as anything, okay, but they didn't, it wasn't legal the way they got their money, but they were rich, and I wasn't going to tell them not to do it. They would have put one right here, <laughs> okay, so I didn't do that. But however, measuring our spiritual success, now that's the sine qua non. Because as a Christian, it's a little bit more difficult to measure your spiritual success, isn't it? Often there's a little tangible, visible evidence that you can put your hands on to prove that you are living a successful Christian life. And ladies and gentlemen, generally we see that success for a believer is more internal than it is external. I want to give you an example, if I don't, oh, my wife's here, I won't embarrass her. My wife grew up in a good home. Trying to lead her to the Lord is one of the toughest things I ever did in my life. Why? Because I was a rascal. I mean, there's no way that God had to say, you're a sinner, Joel. I knew that. But I chose someone who was moral, that was ethical, that had grew up, who went to the right schools. That was tough. That was really tough. And so when she got saved, I studied her like a book. I wanted to find out, did she really get saved? I didn't want to do it just for me. And then when I started seeing in her, she had an insatiable thirst for the Word of God. Ever since my wife got saved, she started reading the Bible once a year at least and couldn't put it down, always discussing it, uh, asking me questions. And I could see that was the Spirit of God moving in or with her through her. And I was so thankful for that. Now with me, my whole life changed radically. <laughs> That I, was, I, I never took drugs, I told you, and I never stole, but uh, I just loved to have fun and did what I did to survive. But it was very hard for me to see whether or not she genuinely got saved. But uh, remember, Jesus said, you'll know a person by their fruit, amen? And I started seeing all kinds of righteous fruit developing in her life, and I praise the Lord for that woman. Meaning, beloved, this here, that the small amount of external evidence we produce is the result of the internal and invisible activity in our minds and our thoughts and in our souls and our convictions and lives by the Spirit and grace and Word of God. Remember, there is a power in the Word. When we believe it and obey it, it is unlocked, unleashed uh, in our lives, beloved, and it radically begins to change us. Would you say amen? I've told you the things you wanted, you used to love to do, you don't love to do them anymore, and the things you didn't want to do, you want to do them. I never thought I'd want to come to church. I never thought I'd want to preach the Word of God. I never thought I'd want to read the Bible, but from the day I got saved, I couldn't put it down. See, something radical happens, and that's what happens when the Spirit of the living God comes inside of you. That's why there's such a big difference between having a mental head ascent to the historical facts of the Bible and being born again, regenerated from above in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Would you say amen, amen, uh, amen, amen, say amen, 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 okay. You see, beloved, that's why it's difficult for God's children who live in a materialistic world to be able to gauge their success in their walk with God. Now, thankfully, Psalm 1 shows us what makes a successful believer in this moral and spiritual growth and relationship with his God. So, beloved, as the plumb line of God's word moves alongside your life, I want you to see for yourself just how you measure up to God's standard for successful Christian living. 
as we move through this Sabbath, but see if your life matches up with God's word. In other words, gauge your life by the principles that are in this world that show you whether you're godly or ungodly, or whether you're successful or a failure as a Christian. No, that's not to condemn you, that's to help you, to correct you, that if you're going in the wrong direction, blessed be God, now you can start going in the right direction, amen? So this is the gateway psalm, this is the doorway psalm that unlocks, turns the key, so you can understand all of the rest of the psalms. So allow me to share with you this morning the characteristics of successful Christian believers. I want you to see this, but point number one, the first thing I want you to see is in verse number one, the path of successful believers. The path. He says, Blessed walketh not the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, beloved, the first thing I want you to notice in this uh, text is the word blessed, assure. What does that mean? He's a blessed man. It means happy, fortunate. To be envied is that man that doesn't do any of these ungodly things before the Lord. Why? Well, let me tell you why. Because as he knows the Word of God, as he studies the Word of God, beloved, his moral and spiritual compass, the convictions of his life is to please God. When you got saved, wasn't it a priority in your life now? I don't know much, Lord, but whatever I know, I want to please you now. I want to live for you now. I remember when I got saved, uh, I just had a heavy burden on my heart, and noontime at my store was very, very busy, and everybody would come to get all kinds of stuff, but I just had to go out and be with the Lord. So I started walking down along the waterfront, locked it up, put a sign up, gone fishing. Everybody knew me, so they knew that I was kidding around, I'd be back. But I can I mean, you're, you, I have to do a 180 right now. I mean, I had my plans all set out what I was going to do. And I said, whatever it is you want me to do. And, of course, ultimately I got into the ministry. But I, I say that to you, beloved, because probably two months ago, I said, Lord, this has been a heavy burden. And I'm not a young man anymore. And I was praying to God, and God says to me, Joel, you remember that walk you took down Water Street 40 years ago? <laughs> You said, whatever it is you have? (laughs) Well, here it is. (laughs) But imagine that he spoke to me as clear as a day, uh, Isabel, uh, beloved, and he reminded me of that prayer. Because I just wanted to serve the Lord. My heart was, Lord, you're real. You're so real to me. I feel like I could touch you. So, beloved, this man, blessed is the man that walketh not the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You see, beloved, therefore he's blessed by God, because the path his feet trod in life is to always try to walk on the narrow road to heaven and not on the broad road to hell. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, the broad road to hell is the path most traveled by the people of this world, and sadly, most don't even know it. They're going about their business, making money, going their careers, and they don't have a clue, not a clue, of what's going on. They're one heartbeat, one breath away from meeting the creator of the universe. They don't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. I was religious, prayed, but I was not a Christian. I was not saved. And so, beloved, the successful believer tries to constantly and continually the separated walk in life. When I got saved, I had a rock band also. I was a drummer, and I loved the drums. I, I, I was saving to buy some, and then someone had oh, never mind, I won't tell you. But I had to start all over again. But the fact of the matter is, beloved, I, I sold my drums, I closed my band. Now, why? Because I could no longer play the honky-tonks in place we used to go. Couldn't do it. There was just something in me that said, you can't do it. And how many of you remember WPLM here in Plymouth? They used to play the big band music. I love big band music. That's my music. I was born in the 40s, but I should have uh, been a little earlier because I love that. I love those big bands. Uh, uh, but it, they, uh, WPLM played big band music. Glenn Miller. I love that kind of music. Now, when I got saved, I got into my truck one day, and I turned it on, and there was a rock song on, and I used to love rock and roll. And some of it used to be good, okay? I, t- I haven't listened to the kind of music, I don't know how many years, at least a week. Uh. But you know, I couldn't listen to that anymore. I had to turn it on to WPLM. 
And I can remember my mother saying to me, Joel, why don't you play like big band? <laughs> I got my rock band right now. <laughs> why don't you play? You know, she was right. <laughs> that, that is, they were skilled musicians in them days. Today you can't make a heads or tails going on. But the fact of the matter is, beloved, I knew that I had to separate from some things. So what the psalmist, what Solomon is saying here is that the godly man tries to separate from sin and temptation. The godly man tries to separate from the unsaved and this evil world system. And the godly man, notice, he tries to separate from the ungodly. Notice your text. That word ungodly, rasha, means those who are impious, those who are idolatrous. Those who are immoral. And he's talking about the, not only the unsaved people of the world, but those who have walked away from the Lord. See, they're ungodly now in God's sight. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the count of the what? Ungodly is what he's saying. You see, beloved, those who have little or no moral or spiritual scruples or principles, the ungodly have little or no moral and spiritual standards or values or conscience towards God or the things of God, beloved. And the godly man knows that folks like this are considered, now this Greek uh, Hebrew word literally means evil and wicked in God's sight, so he avoids and doesn't associate with godly people like this. He knows that God says in 2 Corinthians 6.14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what business or what, right, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? God said, separate from them. Don't go, hold hands with them. The ungodly man knows he can't do it. He'll get tainted by him. He can't do it. I've taught you before, if someone has pneumonia, and it, I'm, if I would better, I'd stand up on the chair. But, beloved, if you're healthy and that person's got pneumonia, you, he's not going to catch your health. You're going to catch his pneumonia. You chum with him. See, he's going to pull you down. If you're not going to pull him up. And that's why God warns us, because so, everything is always for our eye appeal. And that's what Satan knows, and that's what he did to Eve. Hath yea, hath God said? Doesn't that fruit look delicious? Everybody says it's an apple. I pray it's a lemon. I pray she ate it and she went. Don't you? Because that's what happened to the rest of us because of that. So, beloved, God says the godly man separates. He doesn't associate. What does he do? He separates, the Bible says. Now, listen to me. That means he doesn't socialize with them. That means he doesn't hang out with them. It doesn't mean he doesn't worship with them. Oh, you come to my church. I'll go to your church. Oh, well, listen, you can come to my church because I born again, but I'm not going into your heathen temple. Won't do it. Why? Because I worship the living God. You see, beloved, he doesn't missionary date. A lot of Christians today, oh, I'm going to date the unsaved and I'll win them to Christ. And then the other unsaved person says, you know what? Oh, sure, I believe in Jesus. And for the most part, that's good for you, isn't it? Why? Because you've already got an emotional connection to that person. And God warns of that. See, the godly person does not do that. The godly person does not marry an unsaved person. Now, if you're already married, then God says you need to try to do everything you can to stay together. Amen? And I'm not going in that direction, beloved. But also, beloved, uh, he does not go into business with an unsaved person. In other words, if I'm already in business with someone that's unsaved, then I want to do the best I can until God delivers me to do what I have to. Now, if he leads me out of that, the only way I would get into business with someone else as if that person was what? Saved, because they have the same morals, the same values, the same direction. I can trust them. I know they're going to be honest. They're not going to cheat anyone. So God is saying the ungodly person separates from the ungodly people in this world. He doesn't uh, chum with them, beloved. Instead, he separates. Why? Lest they influence him with their ungodliness, and he now becomes just like them, and worse yet, departs from God. Oh, beloved, I ask you, does that sound like you? Do you separate from the ungodly, or do you associate with them? Hey, let's go out. We're going over here. Okay, I'll go. You know better. You know what God says. God, you run with that crowd. You are ungodly in my sight. You are not godly in my sight. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying the, the uh, successful believer separates, not isolate himself from the unsaved. In other words, beloved, all of us have to work 
with unsaved people. I've got a lot of unsaved friends. But you know when they call me up and they say, hey, JB, we're having a party. I said, you know I can't go there. I'm a heathen, right? You said it, not me. <laughs> well, I said it to him originally. That's why he said it back to me. <laughs> heathen like I was, I said it. But you see, beloved, we're all, we can't get out of the world. We need to be the salt and light in the world. Amen? And I'll tell you right now, I'd rather work amongst unsaved people than Christians. Why, Pastor? Because I want to win them to Christ. I want to get out there. You know, you get strong as a spiritual warrior when you start locking horns with the unsaved. Amen? And they see your testimony. I had a guy come up to my house on a Christmas Eve. He knocked on my door. And I, when, I, when I sold my businesses, and I, I still help the guy make the transition. And he came to me. This is from my lips to the Lord's ear. And my wife would verify it. He says, there's something different about you. What is it? I said, I'm a Christian. And he sat down on Christmas Eve. I led that person to the Lord. The following week, I baptized them. And to this day, this guy's a big computer expert, and he sends me cards from all over the world. And he's still walking with God, praise the Lord. Amen? But he said, this, brother, it, 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 it's God in you. It isn't that it's something that was me. I mean, it was God was changing you. See, he could see that there was a difference. I wouldn't swear like they would swear. They would get all hot. They couldn't bear with me when I was so used to bearing with people, even though I must say in my dotage it's getting tougher. I'll tell you, dealing with people is something else. But I want you to notice these three facts on the point number one. First thing, beloved, in verse 1a, he doesn't believe like the wicked. Notice what he says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The word counsel is the Hebrew word etzah. It means he doesn't listen to their counsel or their advice. He doesn't listen to their invitations to do evil. That is to do the things he knows are absolutely forbidden by God and are contrary to God's word, will, and ways. A lot of people invite you to do a lot of things. Now, they stopped inviting me a long time ago because I wouldn't go. I said, thank you very much for your invitation. I really appreciate that. I said, but as a Christian, I just can't do it right now. And I, I just wanted to be up front with them, beloved. That way there, so we, we haven't, Ellie and I haven't gone to a cookout in 50 years. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm only kidding, beloved. But what I'm saying is the, the godly person, beloved, his hearing is tuned into God's frequency and his allegiance is to the godly path of his Lord. So notice in your text, it says he doesn't walk. Circle that word. Walk. Halek. It means he doesn't listen to or follow their persuasive counsel and pleadings with him to do such ungodly things because he knows it will displease and disobey his God and it could jeopardize and endanger his soul. Oh, come on. Everybody else is going to be there. Why don't you be there too? You know, they're going to have so much fun. Come on. Huh? You know what I'm talking about. If you do, say amen. And therefore, beloved, the Bible says about the godly man in the book of Psalms that he hates every false way. Now listen to me now, that he hates the moral and spiritual filth and depravity of this world. That he hates the sinful schemes and plots and pleas. That he hates the ungodly walk and counsel to pursue the vile course to fulfill the lust of the flesh and now disobey and defy his God, beloved, so he doesn't run with the devil's crowd. All my friends that I grew up with, all of them, beloved, and I love them to this day, and I, I still talk to them, they email me, but, but I don't run with them anymore because I know <laughs> I love to have fun, and, and I, I know I can get carried away, and I just won't do it. I just won't do it, beloved, and that's what God says. You listen to me now. Ungodly sinners, the Bible shows us, have chosen to pursue their own evil ways, their own evil path in life. It is my life. I'll do what I want to do. I'll go where I want to go. Don't have anybody's going to tell me anything. And yet the Bible says we're all under authority to someone. Amen? Amen. Oh, beloved, how thronged that Broadway is. How crowded that evil way is. How deadly that evil way is. So the blessed man first wants no part of it. 
He doesn't want to do that, beloved. They keep their feet unsoiled from their evil counsels and paths and ways. In other words, a successful believer does not believe like the wicked believes, nor do they have the same moral and spiritual value system. They know that when they got saved, they became children of the living God and not children of the devil anymore. And this evil world system, you know, the Bible says, in, read it, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. You're either a child of the devil, you're a child of God, one or the other. You may be a, a good child of the devil, okay? And there's a lot of bad levels of the child of the devil. But the Bible says there's only two. There's only two places you can be, two groups. You can't straddle the fence. You can't walk like this, one foot over here, one foot over there, and go back and forth. And if it's a picket fence, you're going to get hurt. So, beloved, the first sub-point I show you that the successful believer doesn't believe like the wicked. Secondly, he doesn't behave like the wicked. Look what he says in verse 1b. He says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Now, that word standeth, ahmad, means this, that now that he's saved, godly people do not continue. They do not abide or remain. Now, notice this word, way, direct, is the Hebrew word. What do you mean by that, Pastor Joel? That is in the same sinful course of life and action like sinners do now and like he once did before he got saved. Before he got saved, he thought nothing of going out drinking, doing all the things he used to do. But now that he got saved, he says, boy, I can't do those things anymore. Why? Because he's a godly person. He's not a what? Ungodly person. And that's why 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Come on and say amen out there. All things have become new. New morals, new nature, new heart, new thinking, new convictions. You see, all things have become Why? Did you just turn around and reform the old man? No, I've taught you. The new man God supernaturally placed inside of you. So successful believers know that the old man and all of his Old sinful ways died and were buried at baptism with Christ, beloved. And he's now been put away forever. And he's put on the new man with all of his new ways. And, beloved, these new ways now love God's word, will, and ways. They now love God's truth. They love the virtuous moral and spiritual path. They love the narrow road of living a holy, righteous, and godly life to bring God all the glory, praise, and honor. So they don't act and behave like the ungodly any, anymore. Why? Because they so love and adore their Lord that it now pains them to hurt him. I know when I do something, beloved, and I, uh, I had someone cut me off the other day, and they, they showed me an appendage, right? I said, if you only knew who you're dealing with, right? And I, I could see myself snapping it backwards, <laughs> putting it in my mouth. <laughs> and I got on my knees that night and I said, oh, God, help me. He, he just raised that beast in me that I've been trying to suppress. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I, I didn't sweat one or two. I said, you know, it feels so good now, Lord, like a little rip. <laughs> but I didn't do it. <laughs> but, you know, beloved, I, I knew that I didn't want to hurt my Lord. And I said, oh, forgive me, Father. I'm glad I never had a confrontation with a person because I want to maintain my testimony as a Christian and, and as a pastor. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. Listen to me now. When the ungodly say, hey, let's go party, they don't do it. Question is, do you? So when the ungodly say, hey, let's go get high, we're having ourselves a party, they don't do it. Question is, do you? When the ungodly say, let's break the Sabbath, let's skip church. You see, we got more important things to do than go into the house of God and worship. God and hear the word of God and be with the people of God, ministered to by the Holy Spirit of God. Go, Godly people do not listen to that. Why? Because they know what God says. They don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly are the ones that are always trying to lure you away, and they do it on the, on the guise of, seems very wholesome and righteous sometimes, doesn't it? See, beloved. The ungodly, when they say, hey, let's shack up together and have some premarital sex, they don't do it. The Bible says, every sin that a man does is outside his body, but him that fornicates sins against his own body, which is the temple of the living God. Flee fornication, the Bible says. Flee, run from it. That Greek word is ekponeo. 
And that means pornography, that means homosexuality, trend, all of that, premarital sex with heterosexuals, flee from ekponeo. So the question is, beloved, do you have the behavior and conduct of the godly or the ungodly? But there's a third thing I want you to see in the point number one. The successful believer doesn't believe like the wicked or behave like the wicked, but I want you to see in verse 1c, he doesn't belong with the wicked. Look what he says. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now the word sitteth, yeshav, is the Hebrew word. It means that successful believers do not settle down and abide in fellowship or partnership or friendship with the ungodly. Now the question, the $64,000 question is, why? Why doesn't he partnership? Why doesn't he fellowship? Why doesn't he do those things? Because he feels way out of place when surrounded by and rubbing shoulders with the devil crowd, especially the, those who have no interest at all in God, at all in holy things, at all in uh, the Bible. None. Don't you feel out of place like that? You don't have that kindred spirit. You see, beloved, he doesn't have a close and kindred spirit with them. He doesn't have the same goals or desires in life as them. He doesn't have the same hopes and priorities and pursuits as them. So the Bible says, notice your text, he doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. That word scornful, lutes, means he doesn't feel at all comfortable hanging around with those who mock and curse God. Do you? He doesn't feel comfortable hanging around with those who blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ or curse his name. He doesn't feel comfortable hanging around with those who ridicule the Bible, who will scoff and lie with Christians. What are you, a holy roller? Yeah, what are you? The guy said to me one time, you're a cat. I screwed onto the right bolt. What are you screwed onto? You're screwed onto something. I'm screwed onto the right bolt. How about you? You see, beloved, he doesn't feel comfortable hanging around with those who belittle Christ or vilify and criticize the church and other Christians, beloved. Successful believers know that they have nothing in common with such scorners as that. In that same chapter, when Christ is talking about separation, or St. Paul is, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, it says this, Wherefore, come out from among them, now listen, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and I will, you shall be my daughters and my sons, saith the Lord Almighty. God, what am I supposed to do with the ungodly? Come out from among them. What am I supposed to do? Separate from them. On the condition that then, God says, I will be your father. Now imagine that, beloved. If you're not doing it, then God's not your what? You say, Pastor Joel, you're a burr in my saddle. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to get you done. I don't want you ever be comfortable here. I want you striving, getting closer to the Lord, looking for more, growing. Amen. You see, beloved, I want you to note in this psalm, this verse, I want you to note the moral and spiritual downward progression of the ungodly and also the backslider who ignores and disobeys God's warnings here. Now, beloved, notice just a quick of this text. The backslider first walks in the counsel of the ungodly. Oh, gee, shucks, I don't know. Okay, and starts just going along. Then the backslider regresses a little further, and he's able to now stand with them. That word stand means to continue and abide in the sinful activities without it bothering his conscience anymore. See, when he first did, he had the scruples. Not anymore. He had been doing it too long now. And then, beloved, the backslider, lastly, he finds that now he can sit. See, he walks, he stands, and then what does he do? The Bible says he sits very comfortably, very contentedly in the presence and the company and the fellowship of all those who scorn God and make a mockery of all things holy. You know, you listen to me. This is the very problem that happened a lot in Genesis chapter 19. When he sat in the seat of the, in the gate of the ungodly, amen. It was to his total ruin. The Bible says he sat in the gate, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And if God didn't send angels to deliver him out, he'd have been destroyed along with everyone else there. Amen? So, beloved, the spiritual believer realizes that there's a vast difference between himself and the world he was saved out of, so he separates from it. 
Why? Out of love for God. Why? Out of obedience to his God. So that's point number one, the path of the successful believer. Let me give you point number two, the pleasure of the successful believer. Look what he says in verse two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Do you see that word, but? But, that means contrast to, but, conversely to what's going on in verse number one, he says, but, what gives him great delight, that word delight, that's the Hebrew word, what gives him great joy, what gives him great pleasure and happiness in life is not throwing in his lot with the plans and the counsel of the ungodly, as mentioned in verse number one, but it's in him reading and obeying and knowing Torah Yehovah, Torah Yehovah, the law of the Lord. Would you say amen? Torah Yehovah, that's the phrase in the Hebrew. That's his great delight. In other words, God's word will and ways better. He wants to know better. Why? So we can now really get to know the God of the word and develop a deeper and closer and more intimate personal relationship with him. Why does he do it, preacher? So we can now more fully bring his life into harmony and conformity with God's Torah and be conformed and transformed into the image of Christ by the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Would you say that out there? Why does he do it, preacher? He does it so he can now glorify and praise and honor and please the God who saved and sanctified him. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying the successful believer believer daily tries to read and study and obey his Bible. Why? Because he genuinely and completely is in love with the Word of God and the God of the Word. The question is, are you? Don't you love the Word of God? Uh, beloved, David said, I love the Word of God more than my necessary bread. In other words, I'd rather feast on God's Word when I'm hungry than even eat some bread. And I hope you have that same feeling. You see, the word now captured this man's full attention, his affection. So day and night, his nose is in the book. I've taught you before, but beloved, listen to me now. Some of you have been saved and never read the Bible through one time. Now, if you read one chapter, uh, excuse me, four chapters a day, you will read the Bible through every year, one time. Now imagine, get up in the morning, read a chapter with your breakfast. Read a chapter with your lunch. Read a chapter with your dinner. Read a chapter before you go to bed. If you do that one time, uh, uh, four chapters a day, actually it's three and a half, but four, you, you'll read Revelation a second time. But that way, beloved, you will read the Bible through uh, 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 from cover to cover. Most Christians have never even done that. That's what amazes me. I won't tell you what my reading habits are, but I can tell you this here. It's more than one time, four times, or eight times a year. I stay my keep my nose in the book. I want to know this God, beloved. Because the more I know now, the more I'm going to know in eternity. Would you say amen out there? You see, you don't know how to ask the right questions unless you've got some knowledge behind you. Amen? I don't mean just here. I mean when you cross over to the other side. A lot of people that are ignorant, beloved, don't know. Oh, yeah, okay. Not me. I want to know what's going on here. How does this happen? Well, you know, you, don't you want to do that? And you're only going to know it by having the blessed illuminator, the Holy Ghost, the resident teacher inside of you, lighting up the Word of God in your life. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, the successful believer knows that the Word of God is not a book of fables or myths or legends, but it's the very Word of truth that is the divinely inspired, as I've taught you in Sabbath school this year, and God-breathed and infallible, inerrant, and the absolutely perfect Word of God. And so what's he do? Note the word meditate there. You ought to circle that. It says he meditates. That word is hagah. It means he chews the cud like a cow. To meditate means to chew the cud. Now a cow has two stomachs. So he's out there grazing. 20 minutes later, bloop. What does he do? I know it won't sound gross. But what does he do? He burps it up and what? Chews it again. And then he swallows it. Bloop. Burps it up. What does he do? He chews again. Meditate means to do what? Chew the cud. Chew the cud like a cow. Now listen to me, beloved. It means he constantly and continuously contemplates the Word of God. 
that he deliberates and ruminates in the Word of God. And he's always, beloved, bringing his mind, his thoughts, pondering about it, thinking about it. So like King David in Psalm 119, 97, he too can now say this, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. I meditated it at night. King David, remember when he was old with furrowed brow and gray hair, he thought back with his days when he would at night watch the sheep. I can just see him looking at the nocturnal heavens as he's leaning back on a stone or something, watching over the sheep, and he's praising God. All the Psalms that David wrote, praising God, blessing God, lifting up his hand, O oh God, in Psalm 8, O oh God, thou art my God. He shows how God created the whole earth, the whole universe, everything in it, and he's praising God. And so uh, he meditates in the Word of God day and night. And so the godly person, beloved, loves the Word of God, and he lives in that Word of God, and he finds within his pages everything he needs to help him grow, mature, to become a discerning Christian. So many Christians have no discernment whatsoever. Somebody will say, I believe in Jesus. Well, the devil believes it, and he trembles in James 2.19. At least he trembles. A lot of Christians, professors don't. That doesn't mean anything. That isn't the acid test to know whether or not you're a Christian, is it? You say, preacher, I'm getting hot. I'm going to hit you. You have to wait in line to hit me. You have to wait in line, and it's a long one, too, (laughs) unfortunately. You see, beloved, he knows his soul needs it, so he meditates on it, do you? He knows his spirit needs it, so he meditates on it, do you? He knows his mind needs it. Needs it. Be you transformed how? By the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 1 and 2. He knows it is salvation. His life needs it. So he meditates on it. Lord, help me to think like you. Help me to act, react, interact like you. Dear God of heaven, I don't know enough to do this. I need your grace. I need your wisdom. I need your knowledge, Father. I need discernment that comes from the throne of God. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, the scriptures are like a soul-refreshing feast to him. So day and night, his thoughts crave and cling to the Word of God. So do you consume and meditate on God's Word like this? That's point number two, the pleasure of a successful believer. Well, we've seen the path of a successful believer, the pleasure of the successful believer. Now let me give you point number three, beloved, the prosperity of the successful believer. Look what he says in verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now the promises in this text, in this verse, are all conditional. When we live separated lives, when we feed our souls on God's word, then we too can expect these good things that happen to us. Now I want you to notice the four things that happen here. First of all, in verse 3a, His planting. He uses an example from horticulture here. Look what he says in verse 3a. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now the word planted, shathal, in Hebrew, it means to be deeply embedded and ingrained like the roots of a tree so it grows sturdy and strong, beloved, as it constantly and continuously drinks from the water. I've got, a, I've got different gardens around my house. And I can tell you by uprooting some things, when those roots find water, they just start going right toward it. And you can pull a plant out of the ground. If this side is dry over here, the roots will be three inches long. If the water's over here, they'll be six. You know, like I caught a, I caught a fish one time. He said, how big was I? I said, the picture weighed 15 pounds. <laughs> well, the roots are long, is what I'm saying to you, right? You, you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this right here, is that tree knows if I'm going to live, if I'm going to bear fruit, if I'm going to have some leaves, then I need some water. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, trees planted by rivers are never dry. Trees planted by rivers are never wilted. They are always green, and they're lush, and they're lovely, beloved. The successful believer knows that if he lives close to God, who is the very river and water of life, the Bible says, he will never become morally and spiritually dry and wilted in his walk or in his faith with God. So many of you, listen to me now, hear me, don't don't miss this. Sin will keep you from the Word, and the Word will keep you from sin. 
People who have dried up, wilted spiritual lives because their nose isn't in the book. They're not getting the water of life. They're not sitting next to the river of life. And so they wonder why their life inside them is fading away, why it's wilting. Green and lush and lovely, beloved. So, beloved, this person that does this, the godly person, he knows he'll be spiritually alive and vibrant and productive and uh, faithful, beloved. Why? Because he drinks and he draws all of his moral and spiritual strength and sustenance to supernaturally nourish his faith and soul from the endless river of God's Spirit and grace and Jesus Christ, whom the Bible says is the water and river of life itself. Okay? And he knows that. Oh, I ask you, does it sound like you? Or you just go, I, got, I, I, I really got to get up and do this. I got to get my coffee before I go. I get, you know, and I, I get three verses down. Oh, beloved, God help you. You need to get your priorities straight, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and God says all these other things will be added unto you. Get your priorities right, what the Bible is saying. Seek ye first, not second, not third, not fifth. Seek ye what? First. Say it again. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, the Bible says, will be added unto you. So what are you saying to me, Pastor Joel? I'm saying, are you planted as a flourishing tree by Jesus? The river and water of life, beloved, are you constantly drinking from his word? Drinking it up? Or are you moral and spiritually dry and wilted and dying on the vine? You know, beloved, unlike some plants, which live for a season and then die out, this tree in the text has sunk its roots deep and has a hidden source of supernatural life. Therefore, this tree is permanent and not temporal. Therefore, this tree is enduring. It is not fading. Therefore, this tree is undying. It is not short-lived. Hey, I ask you a question this morning. Does it sound like you? Does it sound like you? Well, the Bible says of David, David loved the Word of God. Loved it. Now, he wasn't a perfect man, but when he was convicted of his sins, he'd fall on his face and repent before God. But the Bible says of David that he prospered and became great, for the Lord of hosts blessed him and was with him because he loved the Lord. The Bible says of Joseph, Joseph loved the Word of the Lord. And the Bible says the Lord made all things that he did to prosper in his hand because of it. Imagine, beloved, being 17 years of age. Old Jacob must have done something right because this guy goes down into, sold into slavery in Egypt and yet he doesn't want to defile his God. He lives a holy life. Seven, a teenager. Potiphar's seductive wife tried to get him to shack up. Not so. How can I do this great sin against my God and against your husband? I won't do it. Most people. Most 17 days in my lucky day, that's what they would say, right? Oh, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, this guy prospers. But secondly, I want you to see, beloved, not only the planting, but I want you to see his productivity. Look what it says in verse 3b. He says, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Notice this successful believer lives a very successful or fruitful life. Christian life. His life is filled with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no Christ have crucified the flesh with affection and lust thereof. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. See, his life is filled with love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Beloved, all of us have complicated lives. Everybody does. I have a complicated life, and I got feelings too, you know. A lot of people think pastors don't have feelings. We all have it. But you know what? In the midst of it, I have peace and joy. Because I say, Lord, this, this is out of my hand right now. I've done all I can do. Now it's up to you. You're going to do it. Ah, oh, they're going to get mad at me. This time. When I was in court, if you uh, looking at my thing on, uh, the other day, March, for some reason, the judge and I hit it off really well. So when I went to the you know, we're picking the jury, but I went up there, and they had the prosecutor, they had the defense attorney, and then the judge was up kind of, he's looking down at me with his glasses like this, and he says, uh, everything you said is recorded. I said, Your Honor, you're not going to blackmail me, are you? And he says, why would you say that? 
<laughs> I said, what am I being taped? So he started laughing, whatever like that. But then he says to me, have you ever been accused of any crime? I said, I'm a preacher. I've been accused of everything. He says, you have? I said, yeah, but I haven't been convicted of any. He says, you ought to be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <he said. laughs> Yeah, I've been convicted. I've been accused of everything. I'll never forget one night my wife and I were at home and my back was killing me and I was rubbing my back and the phone rings. This seductive voice says, you know, your husband's out with me tonight. And Ellie says, oh, he is? <laughs> oh, yes. And he's a great guy, you know. <laughs> I don't know what all this stuff. She said, geez, I'm rubbing his back right now. Don't you wish you could? <laughs> But all kinds of brothers, I don't tell you, everything they do to try to entrap you. I, I mean, whenever you preach the word of God, Satan just gets so furious, doesn't he? But you see, beloved, his life filled with fruits of righteousness and holiness and godliness. And his life filled with faithfulness and service and good works because he knows they bring glory, praise, and honor to God, beloved. He knows that this life is the only season. He bringeth forth his fruit in his season, the Bible says. And this is the only season you have in your life to bring forth fruit unto God. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, he's a living tree, and his fruit towards both God and man is plentiful and bountiful, and he's a blessing to both God and man, all those around him. Jesus said this in John 7, 38, that if you followed him, that if you embraced him, that out of your belly would flow rivers of living water. The belly is right here in the Bible. If you... If somebody does something to you and you have an emotional whatever, where do you feel it? You feel it not only in your chest, but where? Down here. Oh, man, I don't want to eat. I'm just the opposite. Ah, man, oh, I cook a turkey. <laughs> Give me a pork chop. <laughs> no. uh, so, beloved, what have I said to you so far? Not much, probably, right? I'm saying this person's productive. The question is this, are the fruits of the Spirit manifest in your life? Remember, I'm trying to show you, you're measuring yourself by the plumb line of God's Word here. God said, this is how you can tell where you stand with me. But there's a fourth thing I want you to see, beloved. Not only is uh, His planting and His productivity, I, uh, I want you to see, thirdly, His perpetuity. Look what He says in verse 3c. His leaf also shall not wither. Now, the successful believer, what he's trying to show us is like an evergreen tree. It's always filled with the green of life. In the wintertime, beloved, when all the leaves of the other trees turn brown and they die and they fall off, the evergreen tree stands out as an island of green amidst all the brown deadness that's all around it. Amen? I'm a forest of deadness. And you see, they're unaffected by the winter or the weather, beloved. In our lives, what he's showing need to be constant. Our lives need to be in perpetuity like the uh, uh, evergreen tree. You know God calls us to be stable? I, the hardest decision in life is indecision. People are so afraid of making a mistake. And beloved, you, you, you learn probably more from your mistakes than you do from your successes, right? But you don't say, well, I, 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 if you knew the answer to everything, you wouldn't need faith to begin with. So sometimes you just have to step out in faith, and if you fall on your face, you get up, knock it off, say, you know what, I tried. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7 says. So you get out there, and you try. So God says, I want you to be stable. I want you to be uh, persevering in the faith in the spiritual battle. While everyone else is around you drying up and dying like old leaves falling from the tree, I want you to be stable. I want you to be dependable. You know, beloved, the godly people sometimes, there's a lot of curveballs that are thrown in our life, and they knock us off. But thank God. I mean, I praise the Lord for His consistent and dependable, persevering people. The question is, are you one, or has your leaf now faded and fallen off? What's your life like, beloved? The fourth thing I want you to see under this point is not only his planting, his productivity, his perpetuity, but notice his prosperity in 3D. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In other words, God will bless the successful believer's moral and spiritual life. God will bless the, spirit, the successful believer's personal and family life and his business life, his church life. 
Beloved, we can attest to that. When we started this church, the denizens of hell came out to try to stop us. They came out of work. They protested us, signs up and down, everything, right? Why? We had the temerity to preach the word of God. But you know what? They're all by the wayside. And we're still here. And to the glory of God, we paid it all off. Amen. <laughs> it's to his glory. You see, God says, I'll make you prosper. And he'll also give you eternal life to prosper. How's that? So, beloved, that isn't to say there won't be stormy seas in our life, but the successful believer is going to be able to sail through them. Why? Because Jesus is in your boat. He's in your lifeboat. Amen? And so, therefore, he'll be there until they calm down once again. So my question to you is, do you have the characteristics of a successful believer, or do you manifest the characteristics of the ungodly? Now, if you allow me... Two minutes. I'll give you two or three verses that I just figured I'd throw it in just to show you a contrast. How's that? I even put it homiletically for you. Now let me show you point number four, the problems of the spiritually bereft. And I'll make it quick. Verse number four. The ungodly are not so, but like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sin is in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, for the way of the ungodly shall perish. The first thing I want you to notice how the whole scene, the whole tenor, the whole tone of King Solomon has changed here, beloved. And he shows us the warning to sinners by God that I talked about right at the outset. That unlike the successful believer, the ungodly who lack all these things are destitute of these qualities, beloved, are now doomed and damned. Note these three truths quickly. I'm just going to give them to you quickly. The ungodly have, number one, no fruit in verse 4. The ungodly are not so. They don't produce any fruit but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. In other words, their life and works like worthless rubbish and chaff that the wind blows away. In biblical days, beloved, when they pick the grain, the barley, the wheat, they would take a pitchfork, stick it into it, and they throw it up on a windy day. And the wind would go, and the chaff would blow away, and the seeds would drop down. They'd make a pile of, of, of seeds right there, right? God said the ungodly are like that. They've got no fruit. All they've got is worthless chaff. It's rubbish. Number two. I want you to see that the ungodly have no faith. Look what he says in verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation. Now, beloved, notice in the day of judgment, they'll be separated from God. They'll be separated from heaven, from God's people, and they'll be condemned. They won't be able to stand with the righteous. Remember Matthew 25, God says he's going to take the saved, put them on the sheep on his right hand. He's going to take the unsaved, the goats, on the left hand. There's no shagots here, right? A lot of people want to be shagots, but there's none. Number three, beloved, I want you to notice the ungodly have no future in verse 6. The way of the righteous, but he says the way of the ungodly, notice what he says, shall perish. In other words, the omniscient God who sees all things, the omniscient God who knows all things, knows their life, they can fool you, they can fool me, and I always tell people, you don't ever have to worry about me judging you. I would never do that, beloved. That's not me. I wasn't like that before I got saved, and I'm not now. I want to try to help you get to heaven. We're all in this together, amen? But God says the ungodly cannot fool God. They'll be consigned to the burning, boiling, bubbling flames of hell, and they'll perish. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life in John 3, 16. For God is not a son of the will to condemn the world, but the world through him may live. That's verse 17 of that text. Well, beloved, let me close with this. The Bible says that Jesus, when he returns, the scripture says his fan will be in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. That's the earth. And then he says he will gather wheat into his garner. That's his kingdom in the church. And then he says he will take the chaff and he will burn it all up with unquenchable fire. That's the ungodly. Now, in other words, beloved, he's saying they're going to be doomed. And I don't like talking about that. But here we have the gateway psalm to the book of Psalms. So as you read this, as you understand these principles, 
you'll understand Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. Who think? Yeah. Peter quotes that on Pentecost and that in the book of Acts. The successful believer. Here's the plumb line. You know, when you build, you take that plumb line and put it down. Okay? Uh-huh. I was trying to level some things out the other day. I couldn't level. I said, nobody will notice the difference. <laughs> I tried everything, right? I said, nobody will notice the difference here. But see, beloved, when it comes to our spiritual life, God notices the difference. The gateway side, the characteristics of a successful believer. Let's